five causes of chronic fatigue. We're going to dive into five causes that you should consider if you're dealing with chronic fatigue. Chronic fatigue is a very common issue that people go to their health care provider for. And they're frustrated because sometimes they get the answers they are looking for, but oftentimes they're told, we're not sure what's going on. Let's try this, let's try that. And you're really just trying a bunch of things, but there's not a great reason to do it. So we're gonna go through this list of the top five, but I'm also gonna explain how to look at this. So number one is going to be blood sugar, okay? If blood sugar is off, this can create fatigue. Now, one of the things you should always be asking yourself is, does your energy change when you eat food? If it improves, usually it's because your blood sugar is going too low before you eat. If it go, if you get tired, it's because your blood sugar is going too high. So if we look at what's considered really a healthy blood sugar, okay, we're gonna put on the low end about 70. On the high end, let's put 120, right? And then in the middle, let's call it 85, 90 as really the best blood sugar range that you really want to be. So when you eat, this is going to go up, but you don't want it spiking too high. Your blood sugar should not go from eating at 90 and then now I've had food and I'm 180. That is too big of an increase. That's ultimately going to cause damage. Because what happens is when you spike too high, you then come down and crash. So this is something we see, especially with diabetics and those that are heading to diabetes in their future if they don't make changes, is they eat, man, I'm, I'm tired, right? The food coma. And then a few hours later, like, oh man, I feel like crap again. I gotta, I gotta have my soda. I've gotta have my Big Mac. I've gotta have whatever it is that's loaded with sugar because guess what? They're on this blood sugar roller coaster and it's ultimately destroying their health. So make sure you know where your blood sugar is at. So when we talk about blood sugar in labs, the most common lab that's done for blood sugar is really just doing a fasting glucose. Once again, really shoot for this range to be about 85 to 90, no higher than 95. But this is not a complete picture. You've got what's called your hemoglobin A1C. So I just write A1C. This is your average over the lifespan of that cell. So about 90 days. Normal is anywhere from about 4.7 to 5.4 is really gonna be considered like a good optimal range. Now when you look at the lab ranges, anything less than 5.7 is considered completely normal. Once you get above 5.7, you've hit pre-diabetes land. Once you hit 6.5 or higher, you now hit type two diabetes. And the thing is, your body will battle with this for a long time before it ever becomes elevated. So how do you know your body is battling with this outside of your symptoms of how your energy changes when you eat? That's where we looked at the equivalent of glucose. On the other side is our body dumps insulin to handle glucose. So where is your fasting insulin? When you go in in the morning, yes, a lab range is gonna be anywhere from like a two to a 25. Really ideal is between a four and an eight. So if you're eight hours without food and your insulin's still up at a 20, it's up at a 30, that's a big issue. And that can occur even while your glucose is still normal. So take this as a warning sign. Next, kind of the equivalent of the A1C is a measure known as your C-peptide. See, a peptide is a more stable marker of insulin. When this starts getting elevated, you know you're developing insulin resistance. Insulin resistance can precede in increasing your A1C. So once again, your body is going to compensate the best it can, but make sure you get this addressed, okay? Now there's definitely more we can go into on the blood sugar side, but this is what you need to understand and you need to make sure this is at least looked at. Usually, Glucose will be looked at. A1C may be looked at, maybe not, depending on the provider. Um, C peptides rarely looked at in traditional medicine. And insulin, once again, depends on the provider, but they're not being as picky. And so when we talk about lab range, I do want to bring this up. It's a average, and then they do standard deviations based upon 
the general population and our general population is getting more and more unhealthy. So you could be at the very high end and, and not be out of range yet, but guess what? That's still abnormal, okay? It is abnormal. We don't wanna wait for you to break because then what's the treatment from a traditional standpoint? More drugs. And what's the treatment from a natural standpoint? Well, it's really about getting your nutrition and everything that's driving us off and then supplements if you're if it's needed. But if you know where you're at, you don't even have to do supplements for this usually, but you need to know where you're at. All right, so that's number one, blood sugar. Number two, thyroid. So your thyroid's this gland that lives right here. And thyroid ultimately controls the rate at which the cells in your body function. Now, when you go to your doctor, they're gonna run a TSH, and they're also typically gonna run a T4, maybe a T3. And usually they don't do all three, but maybe. TSH, when this goes up, imagine that's like a manager screaming and yelling, hey, I need you to produce more thyroid, let's do more. So they're looking for that to go up, and then these two to go down, and then they can say, you have low thyroid. But you don't have to be at that level yet for your thyroid to still be a cause of your fatigue. Because the most common cause of a low thyroid is autoimmune. The two markers you need to know for this is thyroproxidase and thyroglobulin antibodies. If these are elevated, either one, you can still have fatigue even if your TSH is currently normal, because this means you have an autoimmune response, but it hasn't done enough damage yet to your thyroid to impact how it's producing. So you need to know these markers, and then there's more, once again, that we could go guns, but thyroid. And thyroid's usually one of the most commonly blamed things when it comes to fatigue. But as you can tell when we're going through a list of five, right, it's definitely not the only one, so don't get too attached to it. Next. Gut health. So a lot of your immune system lives in your gut. So if you're eating foods that are inflammatory, this is gonna create more inflammation and it's gonna ultimately impact the, how healthy and efficient your cells work, which can lead to fatigue. It can lead to inflammation and bloating. And you don't need to have digestive symptoms to have a bad gut. For some people, a bad gut manifests as brain fog, it manifests as fatigue, it manifests as joint pain. It also, what we talk about thyroid with thyroid autoimmune response, guess what? It's going to drive back. Now the other side is, because your digestive tract breaks down your nutrients, you're, you're not gonna absorb everything. The amount of people on medications for let them we're doing omeprazole, Nexium, Prozac, right? All of these things that are antacids blocking that, they're ultimately impacting their absorption of B vitamins, vitamin D, and other things like that. So when you're creating nutritional deficiencies, that can create fatigue. Not specifically just because of what's happening in the gut, but because those nutrients are needed by the cells in your body to be healthy and do their job right. All right, the next one that you need to know about is the brain. So your brain uses anywhere from 25 to 30% of your entire body's energy. There's no other organ that uses as much energy as your brain. So if you've got chronic fatigue, you need to have your brain evaluated. Because yes, everything we've talked about can impact fatigue and can impact your brain. But you need to have your brain evaluated. How do we do that? Eye movements and balance are two of the best. Now there's other things beyond this. If being on a computer screen, doing work for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, you're like, man, I'm tired. I'm more tired when I'm reading, I'm having a conversation, doing emails than I am if I go and exercise for 30 minutes. Good chance your brain's not as healthy. Now there's a lot of reasons your brain may not be healthy. It can go anywhere from sleep deprivation, from chronic stress, from blood sugar issues, diabetes, mold. But outside of that, you've got concussions. Many concussions go undiagnosed and untreated. 
So I actually see this a lot where patients come in with chronic fatigue and it's from untreated brain injuries. Now, sometimes they were diagnosed, but other times they were just never diagnosed. It was misdiagnosed as whiplash, just neck pain, and other things like that. So make sure your brain is really evaluated. And then lastly, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a growing problem. So with sleep apnea, usually what's happening is your brain isn't able to signal for the breathing pathways to work right, or there's obstruction, okay? As a society, as our weight's gone up and up and up, the amount of sleep apnea is gonna go up and up. Now, keys and clues to knowing that it could be sleep apnea is going to be, hey, I wake up in the morning and I'm dead tired. I'm not rested. I need frequent naps throughout the day. I just feel like I'm a zombie. If that's the case, make sure you are getting tested for sleep apnea. Now you don't have to be drastically overweight to have sleep apnea as well. So don't let that impact it. Also, are you snoring really loud, right? Does your significant other notice that, hey, there's times they're, they're not sleeping. You know, I hear them just stop breathing during the night. That can cause sleep apnea as well. And it would be a sign of sleep apnea. And if it's there, make sure you've got it addressed. Because ultimately, if that's not addressed, even if you do everything else right, you're not going to get the results you want. So these are five things you should know about for chronic fatigue. I could keep this list going on and on. It's important when you go and get help for chronic fatigue that you have a detective who can help you figure out which one or which combination is likely the biggest driving factor for why you're feeling the way you do. The biggest mistake we make is we go to Dr. Google and we look for the one thing that's going to magically explain everything we're dealing with. Usually though, in my experience, it's not one thing, right? People come in for thyroid, only about a third actually have a thyroid issue at all. Another third, it's completely their brain. For most, though, it, it is a combination, right? It's, well, your blood sugar's playing a role, your gut's playing a role, and your brain's playing a role, plus your stress response, plus your hormones, and other things like that. So you need a well-rounded approach where they work with chronic fatigue, they, but they also know how to dissect it. View it like, hey, I'm a, you, you're hiring a coach for your, a football team. You don't want a coach that only runs three plays. They're gonna be highly predictable and their success rate's not going to be that good. You need someone to step back and say, okay, how do I evaluate to, to say, what should we actually be doing as we run these plays and what's gonna give success versus not? Same thing is true when it comes to your health. You need to be able to dissect what's happening in each and every part of the body as well as how one part of the body is influencing the other. With that, you spend less time guessing and you can figure out what's the most important thing to work with and from there, you now have a treatment plan that's meant for you and not just a standard, hey, you love thyroid doc, so you're gonna give me thyroid supplements or you're gonna you know, push my thyroid medications to the upper limit, even though there's really not great reason for doing it other than they love thyroid. So I hope you found this information useful. Go back, watch it again, comment, let me know what you think, and please subscribe and follow me for more information. And if you'd like to work with me, you can visit drspencerzimmerman.com. And from there, you can be guided in a how to best work with me.